All right, here we go. Chapter 25, the last chapter of Spy School. Apprehension, Academy Training Grounds, February 10th, 1,340 hours. One of the advantages of being gifted with mathematics is that you never forget a phone number. I called Zoe first because she always knew everything that was happening on campus. She answered on the third ring, hello? It was lunchtime, and I could hear the usual, the usual stuff going off going on in the background in the mess hall around her. Zoe, it's been smokescreen. Where have you been? You missed an awesome psychological warfare lecture today. Have you seen Murray in the last few minutes? Erica led me up a flight of stairs through a secret doorway to emerge from behind a rack of guns in the armory. Greg Hauser, who worked at the weaponry checkout desk, snapped awake and tried to look like he hadn't been napping on the job, even though there was a strand of drool hanging on his lip. Why are you looking for Murray? Zoe asked. Because he's a mole, I told her. Wash out? No way. He's way too lazy. It's a front. He just tried to blow up the hail building, and now he's on the run. Do you know where he is or not? I haven't seen him, but hold on. I heard Zoe shout at the top of her lungs. Has anyone seen Murray? Someone shouted a response, but then Zoe got back on the phone. Black Belt says she saw Murray leaving Bushnell Hall two minutes ago, heading toward the training grounds. That made sense. The grounds were the opposite direction from the main gate which had the highest security. Murray was probably looking to sneak through the woods and go over the wall. Two, excuse me, training grounds, I told Erica. Erica had already grabbed two M16 rifles off the rack. She tossed one to me along with two extra clips of ammunition. Let's go. Wait, Hauser protested. You can't take those without filling out the H33 semi-automatic request form. We're on a mole hunt, I said. Come on. Really? Hauser looked like a kid who'd just been offered a puppy. Awesome. Erica frowned at me, but she didn't take the time to argue. She simply ran out the door. I followed. Behind us, I could hear Hauser scrambling to grab a weapon of his own. I got back on the phone. Zoe, round up everyone you can get out on the training grounds. We need to find Murray before he gets away. Already mobilizing? She said, shoot to kill. Uh, I don't think that's necessary. I, prob I replied, maybe shoot to hobble? Erica darted across the quadrangle. It took everything I had to keep up with her. She wasn't even breathing hard. Anyone else you want to invite to the party? She chided. Your grandmother, maybe? We can't cover all 290 acres by ourselves, I panted. The more eyes we have out there, the better. Erica tried to give me a disapproving stare, but I could tell she knew I was right. See, across the quad, across the quad from us, the doors to the mess burst open. Students poured out, racing toward the training grounds. The troops had mobilized in a hurry. But then, since this was the first actual call to action at a campus full of wannabe spies, that wasn't really surprising. Erica and I were well ahead of the others, though. We plunged into the woods. It had been bitterly cold in the two days since our war game, and what snow remained on the ground was now as hard as cement, which meant Murray wouldn't have left fresh tracks in it. Okay, math whiz, Erica said. Murray's probably heading from Bushnell toward the closest point on the perimeter, and he has a two-minute jump on us, so what vector gives us the best chance of intercepting him? I considered all the variables, then pointed slightly north at due west. Erica adjusted her course and went that way. I followed dutifully. We moved quickly through the forest, leaping down trees, ducking branches, skidding on the ice. Erica stayed silent now, conserving her breath and energy, so I did the same. Many of our fellow students weren't as professional. I could hear them whooping and hollering as they came through the trees, like this was a party rather than a life or death mission. We came upon the goalie where Zoe had saved me two days before, which meant we were closing in on the perimeter. I didn't see any evidence of Murray ahead. Not a footprint, not a flash of movement, not a white puff of exhaled breath in the cold. Either he'd made it to the wall faster than I'd expected, or a line of bullets tore across the ground at my feet. Ambush! I dove my... I dove for cover under a log. Erica flattened up against a tree ahead of me. Do you see where he is? I asked. That wasn't for Murray, she grumbled. That was friendly fire. Then she yelled back into the woods. Lay off the artillery, you dimwits. It's Erica and Ben. We're the good guys. Sorry, I heard Warren yell. My bad. Erica took off once again. As I staggered back to my feet, however, the frozen crest of snow beneath me gave way and collapsed into the gully, taking me with it. I tumbled head over heels, smashed through an ice-covered gorse bush, and thudded into the ste steam bed at the bottom. On the ridge, 
<laughs> on the ridge line above, Erica continued on without so much as a second glance my way. I knew that stopping to help me would have jeopardized any chance she had of catching Murray, but I was still annoyed just the same. I tried to sit up, but my M16, which was slung over my shoulder, had lodged in some rocks. While I, while I futilely tried to wrench free, the rest of the student body th thundered past on the ridge, leaving me behind. You all right? Turned to find Chips getting down through the snow toward me. Yeah, just stuck. I said, how'd you... Hazard called me. I was out on the artillery range. Is Tina on the run? Chip reached behind me, twisted the gun free, and helped me to my feet. As I stood, three pounds of snow that, that had lodged in my jacket slid straight down my back and into my pants, freezing my rear end. It's not Tina. It's Murray. He set her up. Chip's jaw practically dropped to his knees. Murray Hill? No way. That guy's a total slacker. No, he's a master at getting people to underestimate him. I trailed off as my own words sank in. Murray had constantly defied our expectations. He convinced everyone he was a washout, fed misinformation to our investigation, and played everyone off each other. Every time we thought we knew what was going, he was going to do, he'd done something else. A revelation hit me. He's not going for the wall. He's doubled back. I scrambled back up the slope of the gully as fast as I could. Wait, Chip yelled. How do you know? I just do. There was no time to explain it to him. I was only putting it together as I ran. Murray knew he'd be seen heading for the grounds. Heck, knowing Murray, maybe he'd even allowed himself to be seen. Murray wasn't very athletic, though. He knew he didn't have much of a chance of beating Erica to the wall. But if he let her think he was heading to the wall, as well as every other student on campus, then he'd leave the path to the front gate wide open. Another diversion. All he'd have to do was find a place to hide, wait for everyone to stampede past him, and then go the other direction. I raced back through the woods. Behind me, I heard Chip rallying the others in his own personal way. Turn around, you morons. Ben says Murray's double back. Far ahead of me, through the trees, I caught a glimpse of Murray, climbing down out of a huge oak. He saw me as well, paused while he considered all his options, and then fled like a coward. By the time I emerged from the woods, he was all the way across the quad, skirting the hill building on his way toward the front gate. Murray, stop! Before I even knew what I was doing, I swung the gun off my shoulder. Don't make me use this. Murray froze and turned around, allowing me to see he also had a gun in his hand. He aimed right back at me. When he spoke, any friendship he'd ever shown showed me was gone from his voice. Instead, it was cold and disdained. Just back off and let me go, Ben. You don't want to duel me. I know you can't hit the side of the broad side of a barn, especially from that distance. Adrenaline coursed through me. My heart hammered in my chest. Drop your gun, Murray. You're under. Murray didn't even let me finish. He opened fire. The first bullet plugged a, few a tree two feet to my right. I had the chance to shoot back only twice before taking cover. As I dove, I felt a round, I felt a round tear through the sleeve of my jacket and neck on my left arm. Neither of my shots came anywhere close to Murray. But then I wasn't aiming for him. He was wrong about one thing. I could hit the side of a barn from that distance. More to the point, I could hit the roof of the hail building. The ice on the steep peak <clears throat> roof, steep peaked roof had frozen into a crust several inches thick. Both my bullets pounded into it, sparking a network of fractures. A few small glaciers cabbed free and rocketed off the roof, knocking a dozen massive icicles loose from the eaves en route. Murray was too busy shooting at me to see it coming. The ice plummeted four stories and flattened him. He face planted in the snow, out cold. I got back to my feet, clutching my arm. In the movies, when heroes got winged by bullets, they always shake it off and keep going, like they've been bit by a mosquito. In real life, it freaking hurt. It felt like someone had dragged a red-hot pocket <laughs> across my arm and then punched me a few times for good measure. Thankfully, the wound wasn't too deep and wasn't bleeding too badly. My heart was pounding so loudly, I didn't hear the other students until they were almost upon me. Chip was the first to arrive, though everyone else wasn't far behind. You took out the bad guy? Chip asked. Nice. He raised his hand for a high five. Sorry, I can't do that right now, I said, pointing to my wounded arm. You got shot? Zoe was suddenly at my side, her eyes wider than usual. Awesome. You're the first in our class to have a, bull a battle scar. That wasn't for me, right? Warren asked. I mean, back in the woods there, you looked like Murray. He stopped and gaped at Murray across the quad. Holy cow, you killed him. A series of gasps rippled through the crowd. Oh, for Pete's sake, relax, Erica sighed, emerging from the trees. Ripley's not a killer. Murray's unconscious. 
She stopped beside me and casually inspected my womb. Ah, uh, that's barely even a scratch. You'll be fine. Just keep pressure on it. She started across the snow at the prone body of the mole, taking everything in. For a few moments, she seemed to be her usual distant self, and I wondered if, if I'd annoyed her by taking out the bad guy before the entire class when she really wanted to do it. But then she turned back to me, patted my shoulder, and smiled. Good work. Another series of gasps rippled through the crowd, but now everyone was reacting to Erica. It was the first time many of them had seen her touch on their human being without being involved in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I think for a lot of my fellow students, getting Erica to smile was even more impressive than rooting out the mole. I grinned back. In that instant, all my misgivings about the Academy of Espionage flitted away. Sure, the place was poorly managed, run down, and occasionally life-threatening, but I now felt like I belonged there. I'd proven myself. I'd made friends. I'd earned the respect of the most beautiful girl I'd ever met. And I'd thwarted the plot of a criminal mastermind to behead the entire intelligence community of the United States of America. Regular school couldn't hold a candle to that. For the first time since I'd arrived on campus, I had a sense that everything was going to work out for me there. Across the quad, Alexander Hale emerged from behind the chemistry building with his gun raised. He cautiously approached Mar Murray's prone body and nudged it with his foot a few times to make sure he was really unconscious. The door banged open and a dozen men in three-piece suits and military uniforms poured out of the Hale building. I recognized the principal's red face among them. Is that the kid who planted the bomb? He asked. Yes, but he won't be causing us any more trouble. Alexander set one foot upon Murray's haunch and posed dramatically, as if Murray were a grizzly bear he downed. I've neutralized him. The espionage elite and military leaders reacted with awe. There were shouts of, well done and bravo. A few actually applauded. Alexander bowed dramatically, soaking up their praise. I turned to Erica, stunned. Did your father just steal all the credit for what I've done? Looks that way. Erica put a friendly arm around my shoulders and smiled. Welcome to the wonderful world of espionage. Okay. That was the last chapter. There's one page um, that is a letter from the Office of Intelligence Coordination at the White House to um, CIA headquarters. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. Classified documents enclosed, security level AA2, for your eyes only. After reading the enclosed transcript, it is evident that considerable work lies ahead of us. It appears that the re-evaluation of, and then it's blacked out, the, gover the governess of the Academy of Espionage and the CIA itself is in order. It is shocking and disarming that the only person in the entire intelligence community to uncover direct evidence of Spider is a first year at the Academy. Worse, a first year who didn't even officially qualify for entry. Immediate further investigation into the nefarious organization must proceed at all costs. To that end, I recommend Benjamin Ripley's acceptance into the school to be made official. He has certainly earned it. As he remains a target for Spider, he should be given K-24 security status, although at this time it is probably too early to brief him on Operation Enduring Assault. If he knew that, and it's blacked out again, He'd probably flip out. Instead, allow him to once again believe he is a normal student at the academy whose life is not in the slightest bit of danger. In addition, as far as the investigation of Spider is concerned, I recommend immediate activation of Blackout, aka Klondike. I am fully aware of the inher inherent dangers in doing so, but desperate times call for desperate measures. If Spider is not neutralized soon, this could portend the end of the intelligence community and perhaps even the United States of America as we know it. My best to Betty and the kids, and then the name is blacked out, and it says Director of Covert Affairs. 